There we are, folks. Ted Rawson here in our downtown Honolulu studios, uh, Think Tech Hawaii, overlooking beautiful Waikiki in this case. And uh, with our show, Where the Drone Leads, weekly portrayal of what's taking place in the world of drones applicable here in Hawaii and across the world. And in fact, we have one of our across the world travelers on as our guest today, uh, Chuck Devaney in Las Vegas is standing by. Chuck, welcome aboard again. Happy to be on the show, Ted. Thank you. Okay, and actually, Chuck's probably the very first guest on this show going back, what, three years or so by now, I would guess. But uh, Chuck's been on the show many times, but this is the first time, Chuck, you're going to be reporting to us on what took place at one of the world's largest drone conferences just completed today, as a matter of fact, down in Dallas, the AUVSI, the Association of Unmanned Vehicle Systems International, international, big term. So Chuck, uh, tell us about your trip to Dallas and kind of in 25 words or less characterize the show. 25 words or less. No, nah, that's actually, okay. that, that's so, a throwback. Um, Make it 25 words or more, Chuck. Okay, 25 words or more. Uh, it was actually my first experience at AUVSI. I've always been too busy either with school or actually in the field doing the work. Um, but it is a very large show. It's a very friendly show. Um, I was told that it's you know primarily um, military, but I didn't really see that this year. I thought it was a pretty even distribution between the private and public sector. Um, I saw a lot of, uh, of the larger aircraft that I, you normally don't see unless you're, you know, at a test site or a part of a large commercial entity or the military. Um, I saw some very small drones are coming out of the, uh, the Intel booth doing a lot of the swarm stuff in their cage. Um, I saw lots of new up and coming sensors coming out. And uh, most importantly is uh, all of the new ways to deal with data and data management and dissemination. That's cool. So and software. that whole issue of uh, data management, dissemination, security, uh, extraction, expression, all that sort of thing, that's really where the end game is in this game anyway. And uh, in the times I've been to the AUVSI show, we didn't see much of that in evidence. It was mostly the aircraft or the rotorcraft themselves. What you're seeing is a change then, a reflection on that that new awareness that it's the product out of the, out of the uh, UAV, some, more so than the UAV, that really matters here. Is that what you're saying, Chuck? I don't really have a baseline in terms of, you know, who was there before, and, and I know who's been around for a while, but, you know, some people have a booth, some people don't. Um, but I did see a fair amount of, of uh, you know, up-and-coming solutions, at least in, in some of the hardware, uh, you know, video encoders, um, some video dissemination stuff. Um, a little bit of fleet management as well in terms of software but you know of course as AUVSI probably usually is it's really really overrun by hardware distributors and in actual aircraft distributors that's where the real eye candy was of course right so the the uh, the things that attract you are the the airplane models helicopter models and such hanging from the ceiling and then the big booths but uh, once again it's all that analysis that goes on and then even below that is the cyber network functionality that keeps it all together. This is a, yep. a, a fairly distributed network function that makes a drone run, and especially if you think of the rules and the training and such that, require, that are required of the operator and the reliability and such required in the electronics and then the way that the whole thing integrates with other users in the airspace. So that large picture is uh, Starting to come into focus then is what your experience has been, Chuck, and that's really good news to hear that people are starting to think at that level. Exactly. Um, you're seeing a lot more standard you know, operating procedures starting to come about and different software packages that are being designed around those standard operating procedures so that people can standardize, actually you know, become a part of a uh, standardized industry in the way uh, you like we were talking about before we even came on, how do you survey a stack? How does one operate in an environment where there's a fire and potentially another aircraft in your immediate airspace? Um, all of that stuff is still kind of being sorted out, but the fact that it is being sorted out is very promising. It's That's gonna great. make it a lot easier for us to reach out to, to those public entities that, that are gonna be using this, 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 uh, this technology. Could you sense anywhere where there's a, like a centroid or where this understanding is coming together and is easily understood and expressed and maybe collected 
Is Somewhat, that... you know, everybody, there's little pockets of, of, uh, of public service people, both law enforcement and fire, that are kind of coming up with their own. And I think some of those people are starting to talk, talk to each other. Um, one person I ran into was Gene Robinson. Um, and I talked to Gene Robinson at great length. He actually has a company now called Drone Pilot uh, Inc., I believe. And uh, they're coming up with their own set of uh, standard operating procedures. And they're actually, it sounds like they're talking with uh, the FAA and others as to, you know, making that gospel so that others will follow. And I, you know, Gene being the forefront of the movement, especially in the search and rescue realm and dealing with, you know, uh, FAA and, uh, you know, public, uh, public service, public entities, um, I kind of feel like he might be the, the go-to guy in terms of, you know, being the tip of the spear and actually um, organizing the whole thing for us. That's, that's cool. And that's, under, that's really important for us to understand here in Hawaii because as we operate, manage, and, and generate business for the Pan Pacific Unmanned Air Systems Test Range Complex, which is now Hawaii, Alaska, Oregon, Mississippi, and Kansas, all joined together at the state university levels, uh, it's important for us to know where these standards are, are coming from and, and the, where the strengths are and where the good standards are emerging because that kind of st sets the, the stage against which we have to consider testing. The whole role of these, pan of these test ranges is to take the capabilities beyond where they are today as limited by the various uh, laws, FAA rules and such, and find ways that uh, beyond line of sight, flight over people, cluster operations, things like this can operate equivalent with the equivalent safety that we have today with existing systems. So knowing what is coming out in terms of an operational desire or a standard and then testing against that but beyond where we are today is what we're supposed to be doing. So it's great to uh, uh, see that that is starting to happen. In fact, I was going to show on here, we were going to excite the whole audience here and do something never been done before on ThinkTech Hawaii and portray an Excel spreadsheet on the screen. But we ran into technical difficulties and can't do that, so we save our audience from an Excel spreadsheet. Anybody who wants it, we can provide it. We got it yesterday through NDPTC, National Disaster Preparedness Training Center. It's got quite a few entries on it. It's a collection that ANSI put together of all the standard activities that are going forth in uh, ASTM and RTCA and uh, SAME and ASME and AIAA, all the organizations that are through their professional societies are touching the UAS game in some way are collected uh, on the sheet. And it, it's intriguing to see the range of things that are being considered for standards. And that makes me uh, wonder how the work like Gene is doing that you're referring to, uh, how that fits in here. Uh, the, for example, the NFPA, National Fire Prevention Association, has taken on the role of establishing user needs, uh, user perspectives for uh, drone operations, uh, representing all of public safety, uh, law enforcement, fire, uh, public health, and this sort of thing. And uh, they'll be bringing up those user needs, which would include, I would think, sensor accuracy, uh, battery life, uh, wind tolerance, and operational things that they need to think about. Uh, in the same way, I believe ASME is thinking about uh, search and rescue in some committee work. Then there's all the technical work, uh, motors, batteries, structure, radio communications, uh, chip security, and all these different things have their own category and their own organization watching over them. Even things like uh, human factors. How much sunlight should you be able to look at your screen in and still be able to read it in terms of backlit? So it's, the, the industry is moving in a, in a direction that allows it to have standards and um, sort of self-regulate by imposing standards that are generally accepted. And that's what the FAA wants. It wants uh, a self-regulating industry based on logic and best practices um, to avoid having the FAA have to come in and establish standards or, or establish requirements uh, for us. So anyway, uh, Chuck, uh, uh, what do you think the next year is going to hold in terms of additional directions, additional uh, views and such at AUVSI? Um, I think we're probably going to see more hardware come out, of course. But what I would like to see and what I'm kind of going to push for and as I you know, develop relationships and closer relationships with a lot of these colleagues is we need to bring back in um, uh, data standards. You know what 
the, the accuracy standards of some of this imagery that we're collecting um, to minimize forward propagation of air. Um, in a lot of the reading, I don't really hear much of, you know, from the ASPRS in terms of you know, coming forth and saying, hey, if you want to play this game, this is a set of standards that have been in place for manned aviation um, you know, for, for many decades. And, and if you can't meet or exceed these expectations, then um, we can't accept the data as being anything that's usable or actionable. That's interesting, Chuck. That, that has a couple of different pieces. You set me up to give a speech in two weeks to the uh, Geological Society here in Hawaii. And, and uh, why don't we take what you just said and uh, push that on the society and have them start coming back with what standards might be that they would recognize from a geolo geological perspective. I'm sure that the map makers and the uh, photo reconnaissance people are all going to come up with uh, similar ideas of what standards are that make sense to them and have mm -hmm. that included in this user-generated uh, requirement space. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you're going to have different levels of that. For example, in my thesis, my graduate thesis, I talked about um, a comparison for automatic spatial referencing and whether or not it falls in with, within the requirements of FEMA in their floodplain maps, and which would work well in a post-disaster scenario in a, in a denied environment where you don't have you know things like street corners anymore or building corners or you don't recognize the landscape at all. At least you can get a pretty decent interpretation within you know three to three to five meters of where it's supposed to be, and that's usable. But then the surveyor he needs two to five centimeter data. And we might have a bunch of people running around saying, because they purchased the RTK system, um, and the RTK system, because it's RTK, just automatically knows where it is from some sort of divine lightning bolt from the sky, telling it that that's where it is. Um, unfortunately, that's not how it works. So we should probably you know, develop some sort of compliance around what the needs of the survey areas because their stuff actually needs to hold up in a court of law. So there might be an industry there or an opportunity for a survey firm to offer compliance checks to people's data sets if they want to go out and achieve survey level accuracy. That's interesting. There's almost a, a, a time dependent functionality based on there. Certainly the surveyor level of accuracy is required at the end of the day when everything's stable. But in a situation such as a disaster management situation or disaster recovery, uh, a lower level of precision might be acceptable up on the first day uh, to a couple of meters. You need to know where to get airplanes and where a truck's going to go and such. But as time goes on, that accuracy is going to get required to be tighter and tighter. Yep, exactly, exactly. And you, you know, if you're going to be using this technology to work with you know cadastral information and the like, or some sort of land dispute. Um, litigation process, you need to be able to show or prove that your accuracy is within a couple of centimeters because that, that matters to someone. That's right. At the end of the day, it's all going to be based on whatever is required to handle any litigation coming down. And exactly. that's, that, that's and the end state. about the coastal environment with sea level rise and the like, um, you know, a, a difference of a half a, a, half a meter or, or, or 20, uh, 20 centimeters could be the difference of several feet of inundation. And so uh, that's really, really interesting because the sea level rise and the global issues associated with that are going to place requirements on us to begin measuring these things in a dynamic environment where you measure, remeasure, do change detection and such. And it can't be done in a willy-nilly fashion. It's got to be done in a, in a fashion that the results are useful and aren't yeah. going to get you, aren't going to make the situation worse. Exactly. We got to minimize the forward propagation of error. Yep, I like that. I wonder who you heard that from, Chuck. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna quote you on that next week. <laughs> you probably heard me say it a million times. If I didn't say it, Matt Barbie said it a hundred times. Yeah. Okay. So the forward propagation of error. Let's talk about the forward propagation of error when we get back from our break here. One minute. Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others. And in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives.
You can be the greatest, you can be the best You can be the king, come laying on your chest You can beat the world, you can beat the war You can talk to God, go banging on his door You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock You can move a mountain, you can break rocks You can be a master, don't wait for luck Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself It is Thursday, noon 15. Ted Ralston here in Think Tech Studios, downtown Honolulu. Uh, Chuck Devaney and standing by in Las Vegas, just gotten off an airplane from Dallas. And uh, Chuck is one of our, is the very first guest on the show many years ago and uh, graduate out of uh, UH uh, master's degree. And uh, now taking his knowledge and wares to Washington, D.C. and now to Las Vegas. So Chuck, uh, Certainly a lot of changes since you first came on this show. I think your fame comes from being on this show, as a matter of fact. So Probably it has to be. I think that's where it comes from. So we need to have a lot of folks come on the show who want to get famous like Chuck. Yep, all my fame. Tweet in. It, <laughs> there you go. So anyway, Chuck, uh, we're talking about our favorite collective term, uh, mitigating, minimizing the forward propagation of error, which has so many uh, aspects of, of thinking about in this whole game of drones as they expand. Tell us about your own company and what you're doing now in Las Vegas. Okay, so uh, the company is called Quadrocopter LLC. We uh, started out in 2010 as a cinematography company, um, which has then blossomed into a, uh, a sales and service of about 658 different products from batteries, props, all the way up to large heavy lift copters. Of course, we carry Free Fly, DJI, Unique, um, and many, many others. Um, they have done very well in that space and it has allowed them to grow and we are starting to develop Hire Me and we are going to start a, a, a geospatial division uh, where we're going to hopefully solve some of these uh, issues with uh, data dissemination and uh, hopefully try to do our part in minimizing the forward propagation of error. That's great. So I, I, I know someone who, who's there who would be very qualified to run that uh, geospatial division. Uh, that would be you, if, if, if anybody needs to know. I'm going to apply. I'm going to apply for it and see what they say. That's I'll let you know how it goes. Right now, I'm, I'll just continue to sweep the floors at the office. Okay. Well, that, but that, that brings up a whole point here. You know, the, uh, the, number, the amount of knowledge one needs to operate drones, UAVs, UASs these days is growing so much and is expanding into so many other areas, uh, such as public land use policy and things like this, that it almost really turns into becoming a, something a service has to provide, a knowledgeable service, uh, no different than other services that we depend on. I, it, it, we're rapidly outstripping the ability of the average uh, scientist or the average researcher to also become a, a fair and, and, and most effective UAS operator. It's, it's really, and, and maybe in another year or so worth of rulemaking, and it'll have got to that point. I mean, there's so much one has to understand because, again, it's all about the forward, re reducing, eliminating, trapping, minimizing that forward propagation of error, mitigating any potential cause. And uh, we had a case recently, we're doing some work at uh, Mokalia, uh, and uh, it was right next to Dillingham Air Airport. So it's Class G airspace. We could assert and just operate there, but that's not reasonable. That's not mitigating, because there's other folks who use that airspace also, and they take. I wouldn't say they take latitude, but they take margin that they think is theirs, and so that's not going to change. We have to respect that and integrate, operate with them, be on the radio, and uh, realize that they will deviate from plan from time to time, and we need to be ready to handle that. So. It's not something that you can just simply walk up and do. And uh, especially like uh, along Ala Moana Park or something like that in Honolulu. Uh, we've got helicopter traffic going by because that's an outbound helicopter traffic pattern coming out of the airport. All the eastbound traffic stays low to avoid airplanes coming in and runs right outside the shore at Ala Moana and Kakako. So and if you're going to operate. Air 1 and Air 2 always flies through there. Say again? Air 1 and Air 2 fly through there pretty low. Right. Rate. And so on a Kona wind day, you got uh, helicopter traffic going out, airplane traffic coming in, and there's no place for drones. So anyway, there's, but those things aren't easy to understand or, or, and they're hard to accept because that isn't what I thought when I bought this thing and took it home and took it out of the box and flew it in my yard. It's not what I had in mind. So 
there really isn't a good platform to get information one needs to be thoroughly vested and have mitigated all the, all the issues or have trapped and, and uh, halted all the forward propagation of error. One of the things you guys could do in the, in the company is, is you know, promote that idea and, and promote the idea and generate the issue of uh, services that are provided that provide all that so you don't, the individual guy doesn't have to worry about it. Exactly. We certainly do plan on contributing to that movement as much as possible. Um, I think that if you're going to do something, you should probably do it right. Um, of course, we, just like anyone else, could have a lot of opportunities for, for uh, you know, certain opportunities for, for, for a job or to, to make an income, but um, also putting people in harm's way. So we, we choose to not go that route. We have uh, three or four 107 pilots, and none of us are really going to put ourselves in that situation. So, you know, we're going to—we feel like we're going to do our part to kind of be stewards of the industry and not, you know, allow that to happen. Of course, you know, anything that uh, can be—and you've said this before—anything that can be uh, abused will be abused, and of course, is being abused. So, um, we're always going to have that, you know, to deal with. But hopefully those people will, you know, continue to just operate in their backyards or, you know, consider it to be a hobby and not jeopardize, you know, the industry while it's still in its infancy. That's great. Do you think you're going to, your company will perhaps put on a booth at AUVSI next year? Possibly, or they just might send me out to go, go lurking once again. Uh, we did have the opportunity to, to uh, talk with many, many potential collaborators. Um, so there is the option of us maybe teaming up with others. I did see that a lot this year, where there would be multiple entities kind of sharing one booth. Like everybody from Nevada was in one booth. Um, of course, the entire Parrot group, which can, you know, uh, includes Parrot. Um, I, uh, well, they had Sequoia in a different group, the, uh, the, the Red Edge cameras. Um, we also, they also have Pix4D and uh, Sensefly. They were all in one booth. Um, so there is the, the option of, you know, possibly doing that. At NEB last year, we shared, or this year, we actually shared a booth with um, Red Rock Micro, which makes these little nifty uh, lens motors. That's so, cool. And uh, uh, that brings up the other point that a small company like you faces, and that's the issue of how many conferences to go to. You could probably go to one a week if you wanted to. And then there's some in Las Vegas, which are right next door, very adjacent to you. <clears throat> also, there's the <clears throat> uh, Drone World in San Jose, which is a, almost a must comply. There's quite a good conference in Alaska and in New Mexico that are long lasting and very respected by the FAA and others who go. So there's a list of probably 10 uh, events around the country and maybe outside the country on an annual basis that really need to have your footprint there. Yeah. So, uh, well, I think that we're going to at least attend the two that are here. At, at one of us will go, whether it be our director or, or myself. One, one of us will, will have a presence there. And we go and we listen to the speakers and we listen to the trends and we talk to as many people as we possibly can. And before I even arrived, even to AUVSI, I'd already had like eight meetings set up with different individuals that I wanted to see and talk to that I'd been in different email exchanges over the past few months. Just trying to, you know, see what do people need? What can we develop for them? What can we, what can we do to establish ourselves as a, as a, a, a successful, viable, uh, error-less entity in this in this industry? That's great. Um, and it would be actually interesting to put together a, uh, a, a, some kind of a professional society of groups just like yours, and uh, establish that self-managing culture and that self-regulating culture that the FAA desperately wants uh, this organization, these organizations to get into. The model they're using is the uh, what's called the light sport aircraft category of uh, aircraft. It's not regulated, it's self-regulated, and it is uh, basically driven by a bunch of retired airline pilots is where it came from, so it's got serious uh, uh, airplane DNA in its nature. But that sort of same attitude would work really well, and uh, style would work really well making this uh, drone game uh, respected and productive and, and uh, uh, probably more expensive <laughs> along the way. Yeah, you know, if, if 
you know, people still need to make a living, and I think a lot of this knowledge and stuff that people that, that has been created in this industry, I think it's you know, it's it's worth the money. And anybody who wants to be serious about it should you know be you know somewhat vetted or go through some sort of training process where they have the skills like crew resource management, good you know safe aeronautical knowledge. I think it's it's important. I think that you know the industry is definitely it's it's the wild wild west. It's the Wright brothers. People are definitely pushing the limits, but at at some point, there's going to you know be the need for more regulation and probably some some stricter uh, vetting processes and and and, uh, and and rating. You know how do you, how are you actually going about getting a rating instead of just you know a 16 year old person can go take the test and pass it and and you're you're able to operate legally within Class G airspace anything less than 55 pounds up to 100 miles per hour. That's pretty significant, to, you know, to, to be able to uh, legally operate. I think there should be some sort of practical involved. I think you should have to do a check ride. And maybe there should be a type rating for a fixed wing and a multi-rotor and different levels of multi-rotors. Those are all really important points. Uh, you think about it, and uh, in the world of aviation, the only license or certificate you can get without any practical training is this one, the, uh, the unmanned air system remote pilot certificate. And just because you spent 150 bucks and went to a class and got your ticket doesn't really mean anything. It, it means you got a ticket. It doesn't mean you have any practical knowledge or know what to do next. On the other hand, if you got yourself a private pilot license, you probably have 40 hours of dual training under your belt. You've got some emergency procedure training under your belt, and you've passed uh, at least one written to get you into that stage. So when you finally do get your private pilot license, you've got a modicum of practical training, and uh, you know what the fuel smells like and, uh, and such, and you've been through airports, you've been through a couple of emergency procedures and such, and you are a step ahead of, of uh, a problem that might occur in, in a limited environment. So, but we don't have that here. And uh, uh, I wonder what the forcing function will be that uh, makes that happen. Um, well, thankfully, knock on wood or whatever I gotta do, one of these things hasn't yet been sucked up into a jet engine. Yeah. Um, Hopefully that's not going to be the deciding factor for this, even though we've had a lot of near misses. You hear about it in the media all the time. Um, or, you know, a fatal accident where an innocent bystander was hit in the head and, and, and the like. We're starting to see now um, where DJI is implementing some no-fly zones, you know, with the, you can't even arm their equipment if it knows it's within Class B airspace or even underneath the wedding cake. In Class E or Class G airspace, it'll still stop you from, from you know, launching that air that uh, that aircraft. And they're doing the same thing in areas where people are using these, um, these this technology for nefarious nefarious reasons. Um, I'm not really sure if that really makes, you know, a point for what we're talking about right now. But, you know, there are steps being made. I think to try to minimize that you know those accidents from happening. That's right. Technical technology is coming in, and that'll that'll be a big part of it. And we're all uh, together working on the issue of uh, uh, mitigating and 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 halting uh, the forward propagation of error. That's what we're all about. And uh, by the way, just as a side note on that, some of those DGI products won't work done at the Kawainui Airfield. That's within the five miles of Kaneohe's Class D. You can't start them. Uh, even though there's a letter, the, the DJI doesn't know about the letter that allows that to operate, uh, allows aircraft to operate there. Anyway, Chuck, thanks so much for coming on uh, after an exhausting trip down to Dallas, and appreciate your updates on what's going on in Las Vegas, and we'll catch you again at some appropriate time in the near future. Sounds good, Ted. Thanks for having me on the show. Aloha. Always great, man. See you later, brother. Okay. Take care. See you all next week, folks. <laughs>